Today I'm here at Godinez High School, part of Santa Ana Unified School District, and I can't believe I started my career here, my first teaching assignment ever. I'm so excited to keynote and kick off their school year. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, uh, my good friend, but our good friend, because she does a lot of work here in, in Santa Ana Unified School District, Dr. Saba Kidwai, who's going to take us through a journey. Let's give her a warm welcome and a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I have to say, it's not every day you get to come and talk to a group of people about what we're actually going to do next, instead of having to talk about, well, this is the future, this is the world, because you're ready. You're ready. I can feel that energy, and I'm so, so excited to chat with you today about what it means to be able to speak AI, but stay human in today's world. What does it mean to really have a human advantage? How do you build it? But more importantly, given the roles that you're all in, how do you go and nurture and build it within others? And so today what I want to do is I want to start with, Jerry said just a little while ago, the choices that we make are going to be so important moving forward. And so one of my favorite books is the book Atomic Habits. And he really challenges our thinking on why do we make certain choices? And how do we really pay attention to the choices that seem so insignificant because they're so small, we don't immediately feel their impact. Yet when those small choices begin to compound, that's when we really begin to not only see a difference, but feel a difference. So to begin, what I would love for you to do is turn to the person next to you and tell them, when thinking about your role, who do you want to be? And another way to think about this question is if people were to describe you, what would you want them to say? So go ahead and tell the person next to you, when thinking about my role, this is what I do. First of all, I want to know, how many of you know, each other, know the person sitting next to them? Okay, a little bit here and there. Okay, so tell them, who do you want to be? All right, about 10 more seconds. All right, so thank you. So I can't wait to hear. But I would love to have some people share either about themselves or what they heard from the person next to them about when thinking about your role, who do you want to be? Who wants to start us off? Just shout them out. Impactful. Inspiring, that's probably the number one word we hear from most people. Ironically, was also when we did the student listening sessions, the number one thing students said, I want my teachers to inspire me. I wanna walk into my classrooms and I want, I want people to motivate me. What else? Yeah. Authentic. Authentic. What else? Transformational. How about this side? Shout it out. Build good habits. Build good habits. Absolutely. What else? Present. Present. Wow, I love that one. What I love about this question, and I really, really recommend if you ever host a meeting or you're bringing people together, this is probably one of the most beautiful questions to start with because every single quality that people mention are uniquely human qualities that can't be replicated by machines at all. So as we begin to think about how we really embody these qualities, how we really get to practice these each and every single day moving forward, I started as a history teacher, so I want to take you a little back, back into the past. And the reason I think it's important to travel back to the past is one, to recognize how far we've come, right? But to also recognize, wow, how, how did things get to be the way they are today so that we can make different choices or reinforce the choices that are helping move us forward as we continue. As you listen today, I would love for you to consider this idea. We often listen to talks and we hear things and we think of good ideas, but one of the best ways to kind of actively be involved as you're listening is to use this sentence starter called, how might we? At the end of today, I'm gonna to ask you to share just one with me but as you're listening today, if there's something that resonates with you that you're curious about, that you wonder about, 
that maybe you even think is impossible. How might we do that? What? I want you to go ahead and make a note of it. So as you're listening today, if there's anything that you kind of resonates, just how might we do this and kind of finish up that sentence. And at the end of today, we'll kind of collect them all. So let's go ahead and look back over the past two decades and think about the young people who walk into our campuses each and every single day that we interact with. If we think about students who today are in university, they have never known a world without Google. If we think about students who are in high school, they've never known a world without Google and they've never known a world without email, but they were also there to see the very beginnings of the rise of social media. For our students in middle school, they have never even known a world without social media. That's their normal for how they communicate, for how they interact with other people, how they begin to get their information. For our youngest learners, those in elementary school, and I think we've all seen little kids do this, they don't know a world where they cannot touch or command technology with their voice. That's their normal. And for ones that were born in 2022, like my little niece, she was born in October 2022, she will never know a world where tools like ChatGPT that can generate things for you in the way that they do are not normal. We're not wowed today by the microphone in my hand, my ability to advance my slides with my phone, or the electricity that's powering all of this that's happening. It's our normal. So when you see tools like this that generate text in the way that they do, to us, it feels like magic. <laughs> Until this day, it doesn't matter how much I use this tool, every single time I do, it feels like magic. I constantly find myself saying, wow. And it reminds me of this quote from Arthur C. Clarke where he says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic unless it existed when you were born. I am so inspired by my niece and nephew. I feel like they have given me a completely, not only a renewed sense of energy for what I do, but I see the world in a completely different way. And one of the most profound shifts I've made in my thinking is that we spend so much time talking about what we need to give kids, but watching my niece and nephew, all I think about is how do I preserve what you have, the way in which you ask questions, your crazy, crazy imagination. I was on a walk the other day with my nephew going to get juice, and he's like, so what should we talk about today? And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> you tell me. And he goes, how about the bees? And I was like, okay. And not that I was able to answer many of those questions, but the idea that like, I, I would never say that to one of my friends. We would talk about probably the most mundane things. We would be complaining about things. And he's like, so what should we talk about? The bees. It's that curiosity. I'm like, wow, how do you preserve that? He's not on a device. He's not walking and talking or checking his social media. He's just four years old, curious about the world, curious about the trees, the leaves, everything around him. Even when I'm making a smoothie in the morning, the blender fascinates him. These little, little things that we take for granted, he's absolutely fascinated by. So we begin to then think about, wow, this is the last two decades. And if you look at sort of the timeline and the evolution of technology, you begin to realize, why, why do these things feel like magic to us? It's really just a very natural evolution of things that have come. However, when sometimes you're inside systems that don't evolve as rapidly as the technology in our outside world, we get some unintended consequences, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning wanting anyone to be unsuccessful or wanting people to struggle in the world, but sometimes it is a byproduct when some, some things move forward faster than others. And so I want us to take a moment to kind of think about, really just in one word, what are some of the unintended ripple effects of not designing schools for a rapidly changing world. Unintended ripple effects. So go ahead and turn to the person next to you and just like one or two words, this is a possible consequence of not having kept up. I 
always love being able to see like how engaged people are in conversation. I feel so bad interrupting. All right, well, I would love for the room to hear some, but you know the other thing I would love to highlight as you kind of just listen to the, like, the level of noise around the room, there is so much to unpack and so much to process as we think about moving forward in today's world. These are not easy steps to take, and so really giving people the time and space to have conversations and really unpack why are we where we are, how did we get here, what are some of the choices that were made by us, by others, so that we are more informed as we move forward is so important. So always, I always think every time, like, wow, like people have so much to say, we need to give people more time to speak. So I would love to hear what were some of the things that came up for you in your groups as you were talking? Unintended consequences, just a word or two, yeah. Oh, the collapse of human thinking, all right. And not good, yeah, not good at all. <laughs> we're gonna revive that. Ah, uh, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. What else? Not maximizing potential. Not maximizing potential. Wow. Tell me more. But it's so important for you to recognize the partners and collaborators that you have amongst each other in the room. Again, it's not every day you get to walk into an organization where not only is the work being done and we're moving forward, but wow, we've got so many thought partners from so many different spaces, different lines of work that we can leverage to be able to really build upon what it is we're doing. So I'm gonna tell you what an unintended consequence was for me. So like I shared with you, I started my career as a high school history teacher and I'm gonna lean in a, a mix actually of the two things that you said from Matt maximizing potential to being able to be an early adopter and what happens when you're not exposed to things. So I graduated as a first year high school history teacher in 2007 and I thought I had done all the right things, right? Like listen to my parents, like I got good grades, like APIV, all the good things, went to UCI, you know, bachelor's, master's, all the things credential. Graduated and got an amazing job. Um, and it was amazing, not so much because of where it was, it was here in Orange County, but it was amazing because it was a humanities. It was English and history taught together. So even though you had separate classes, and so if anyone you know ever taught English or history, you know that's like a dream come true to have that collaboration. And I was like, wow, okay, like I made it. Like daddy was right. I went to school, I did all the things, and here I am, good for me. But if many of you might remember, just a few months later, in 2008, we entered the global recession, and I had truthfully never even heard the word layoff or pink slip ever. Like I just had it. I had a relatively sheltered upbringing and just really had not ever heard those words and definitely didn't hear them in my credential program. And so all of a sudden when I get it, I didn't. I didn't at all. And so all of a sudden when I get one, like I was shocked. I was like, what? I'm not going to have a job? Like I just spent all this money decorating my classroom. I just did all this stuff. I thought I was going to be here for the next 20 years. What do you mean? Like what is this? And like, oh no, your evaluations are great. Like everything's great, but you're just another number. And unfortunately, like you're not tenured, so you don't make the cutoff. We're cutting all our first and second year teachers because you know we've got to increase class size. They had a 20 to one class size, and so that was their first natural thing. And so I was completely shocked. And I was like, I don't understand what was happening. And it wasn't until I read a book by Seth Godin called Lynchpin, where he said, the world of work has changed. It's no longer enough to go get good grades, get a job, and think that you're gonna be fine and retire in like 30 years. The number one thing that's going to help you be successful is understanding what makes you unique. Now remember, this is back in like, by this time it was about like 2010 I had read it. I was always lucky, I always got another job, but it was like bouncing from one place to another and that instability. But in 2010 when I was like, what makes you unique? I was like, wow, like I've never really thought about that before or I've never presented myself in that way before. And once I did, everything started to change. The types of opportunities, the way I was seeing the world, the things I was paying attention to. And so I always say when I went back to school in 2017 to go do my doctorate, school was the same, unfortunately. Like nothing had changed at all, but I had. And I didn't really, I was able to take the things I knew, 
combine them with like the expertise of my teachers and get that guidance and feedback and be able to, you know, like we created a documentary last year, created a podcast. None of those things were school assignments, but I understood and recognized my own potential because I had other people around me that helped me figure those things out. But what's really interesting if you go back to those years, because I went back to those years and I was like, okay, well, what was happening back then? So when you think about 2007, you know what else happened in 2007? The iPhone was launched. You know what else was being launched back then? Companies like Airbnb. Back then, forget 5G, 3G was just starting. IBM Watson, so many things and tools and technologies that today we couldn't even imagine our lives without. While people like me and so many others were being laid off and suffering economically, others understood how the world was changing and therefore were being able to introduce new technologies, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. These are all technologies that came out during that time. I had no idea, not only like about those tools until they came out, but I definitely had no idea how they applied to my academic or professional life moving forward. And so one of the most important gifts we can give young people is access and exposure. You don't have to be an expert in everything, but you should be aware of what exists in your world and what emerging trends are coming your way. So the question becomes, why do some people have this and others don't? And so a lot of my work is now guided by this quote from William Gibson. The future is here. It just isn't evenly distributed. And so I always think the students that you serve are so lucky because being able to expose that demographic to these kinds of existing and emerging trends allows you to maximize their potential, help them become early adopters so that they can get access to those economic opportunities that come as a result. When we look at the research that exists alongside the timeline of these emerging technologies, because I really started to think about like, how did my professors, I went to a good school, I like UCI, I, I learned a lot of great things from there, but I'm really curious, like, how did it not occur to any of you to talk about some of these things? So if we look back in the 2000s, you know, that was one of the, that was when one of the uh, very fit, largely cited paper, the Changing the Grammar of School, right, by Larry Cuban and Tobin Tayak, talking about, like, we've got to change the fundamental elements that make up school, right? Like kids being taught in, you know, independent content areas, teachers working in silos. These are the kinds of things we need to change if we're really gonna see transformation 20 years ago. And then one of my favorite papers, these next two are incredibly relevant even right now. This um, next one came out in 2001 by Paul Outwell, where he said, we don't just have a digital divide, we have a digital use divide. It's not enough to give computers to each and every single student, you have to change the task. And he started to notice a big discrepancy in the tasks that were being done by high socioeconomic communities and lower socioeconomic communities. In lower socioeconomic communities, people were using technology to drill and kill. In higher socioeconomic communities, they were using it for complex problem solving, new projects and things like that. He said, we've got to close that digital use divide. It was 20 years ago. One of my absolute favorite papers, and I always say if there's just one that you take away, this is the one to take away, it came out in 2013, it's called Dancing with Robots. I love that title, <laughs> what a clever title they've coined. Came out in 2013 where they said, when you get to the time of 2023, these are the two skills that are the most important for humans to have. Number one, complex problem solving. Problems to which there are no answers. Like what happens when you get bit by a tick and you're now you're allergic to meat? <laughs> and number two, complex communication. You think this idea, I think this idea, we completely disagree. How do we have a civil conversation? And these are the two things we struggle with the most in today's society. Because what does complex problem solving require? Really difficult communication. And then of course, there's my favorite, the future of jobs report, right? The one that we cite all the time. These are the skills kids need. These are the skills, these are the skills, these are the skills. So then you think about it like, okay, not only do we have all this technology that's been accelerating over the last two decades, but we also have so much knowledge, research, and information. I mean, I think if I was to ask you, is there anyone in here who thinks that the world doesn't need to change? There's nobody in here that wouldn't agree that things need to change. Then the question becomes why? If we have access to this technology, right? We've lived it, we've grown up with it. 
we have all this knowledge and all this research, and we can get even more granular, right, if we want to think about tools like ChatGPT today. This is a chart from Roman, uh, Raymond Kurzweil where he predicts the evolution of artificial intelligence and computing power. And if you go a little bit later into his chart, he tells you in 2023, a computer will surpass the brain power of a human. I mean, predicting things, this is in like 1960, predicting it down almost to the exact year. So we might want to pay a little attention to the next one where he says in 2045, we're going to surpass the brain power equivalent to that of all human brains combined. So then where is the challenge? If we have the knowledge, people even are making predictions as accurate as this. One of my favorite answers comes from Clark and Estes in their book, Turning Research into Results. And they say consideration is rarely given to the fact that everybody has the knowledge. What they're missing is motivation and the redesign of organizations to remove the barriers that are preventing us from implementing the knowledge that we have. And so that's what I want to talk today about, motivation. What are those small things we can do to really begin to help move the work forward? Because you've already made the commitment to redesign your organization, right? With this graduate profile, with your four priorities, you, you've already said, hey, our organization, we're redesigning. We know things need to change. This is how we're going to do it. These are our hopes. These are our dreams. These are our goals. What are those small steps we can take now to really turn these into actionable results so at the end of the year, you can celebrate the work that you've worked so hard to be able to do? Because so many of you in here I know, all of you in here, believe what Seth Godin says. You created the redesign of the system because you know you don't have to be victims of a system that's outlived its usefulness. When you think about changing the grammar of school, you're taking those steps to change that grammar of school. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's from his new book called The Song of Significance. And he says, right here, right now, you have a chance to lead. And you're all here because you've made that choice, right? When we think about those words that you said, impactful, inspirational, transformative, those are the things that you want to be. You're creating those conditions, right? I hear that word from here all the time. We're creating the conditions for the change we want to see. And so now it's about what are the steps we can take? What strategies can I share with you today to not only enroll people at your sites across the district, but also to enroll each other in a journey that creates connection, dignity, and possibility. So it's the small steps now that we can take to get there. It's the difference, this is another concept from Atomic Habits, where James Clear talks about the difference between motion versus action, right? So what does that mean? Motion, I'm gathering resources and strategies for increasing student achievement. Action, I'm taking a step to put them into practice. Motion. I attend a seminar on visionary leadership and education. I'm here listening to all these strategies and all these ideas. Action, I'm gonna choose one. I'm gonna integrate it next week. And so that's what I wanna talk about there. And oftentimes when we think about things like motion and action, especially when we think about action, he also says in the book, people think they need massive action to get results. We need big initiatives, we need big strategies, big projects, and he says instead what helps even more is if you can get just 1% better every single day. But what's the problem with getting 1% better? It's the same problem with why you don't put aside a dollar a day. You think it's too small. What's a dollar a day gonna do? Nothing, it's not gonna make me a millionaire, right? But when you compound, and you begin to do the math on what happens on just 1% every single day, the problem with 1%, they're like, it's not noticeable, but over time, when you start to see those results, they are far more significant than bigger initiatives that take place. Yesterday, Lorraine asked us to look at this chart, and she said to think of one thing that resonates with you. And when I looked at this chart, the first thing that really resonated with me was the sheer number of people that not only work in the organization, but that you have an opportunity to impact. So what does that 1% example look like? You think about the fact that you've got 39,000 students, right? We're just going to round off. 
you've got 39,000 students. If each of those students has just one positive interaction, just one positive interaction, which is like the lowest of the lowest of the lowest, one positive interaction, and they carry that forward, you've now impacted 78,000 people. If collectively those 78,000 people go and impact somebody else, that's 156,000 people. Do you know the population of Santa Ana? Who said it? Around 300,000. So within just two or three people, you've now had the opportunity to impact in a positive way almost your entire city. And I wanna really drive home not only where this idea came from, but just how quickly something like that can happen. So I have a habit of being able to, I have uh, four sisters and I'm really close to them. So anytime I have a presentation like this or I have something else going on, I have a habit of going over and being like, oh my God, I have to do this. I don't know if I can do it. And I'm like freaking out and I'm doing all these things. And so one day I was with my nephew and he was listening to me and he came over and we re-recorded this, but I was like so shocked by what he said, but I'll let you listen. I don't know if I can do it. I'm not gonna be able to do it properly. You can do hard things. I can do hard things? Yeah, I can. Who told you that? My teacher. Your teacher? I was shocked. Like it's me complaining about something to my sister and all of a sudden he comes up behind me. He's like, you can do hard things. Like, you're three and a half years old. What did you just say to me? <laughs> you can do hard things. And I was like, let's re-record that. And I asked him, like, well, where did you learn that? Like, who taught you that? I was like, I don't think we taught you that. Oh, my teacher. His teacher probably has no idea of the impact that she had on me and how much. I listen to this video all the time now. It's like in my favorites. Anytime I'm like nervous about something, I'll like play him. I'm like, okay, I can do hard things. It's also a joke. It like makes you laugh a little bit. So it like relaxes you. But that's how quickly you can have that ripple effect with just one line. I don't even know if his teacher recognizes that she had that impact on him, and that's what she was able to do. My math skills are awful, so when I had that idea, I really want you know, Santa Ana to, to know like, how much of a ripple effect they can have. So I went to Chad GPT because my math skills, I was like, I'm gonna mess this up if I try to do this myself. And so I went here and I said, hey, I wanna know, you know if the district has this many people and I want them to know they have this ripple effect, what are the numbers on that? So within just a couple of seconds, I was able to take this idea and really be able to turn it into impact. And I had the video, I was like, let's put that in, done. And it's not just there that you feel that. These are stories people will share with you worldwide. So I want you to hear this one from Simon Sinek. They happen to have a coffee bar uh, in the lobby of the Four Seasons in Vegas. And so one afternoon, I went and bought myself a cup of coffee. And uh, the barista working that day was a kid named Noah. Noah was funny and charming and engaging. And I spent far too long buying a cup of coffee because I just so enjoyed talking to Noah. So as is my uh, nature, I asked Noah, um, do you like your job? And without skipping a beat, Noah said, I love my job. Now, in my line of work, that's significant. Like is rational. I like the people, I like the, I like the work, you know, I, I get paid well, I like my job. Love is emotional, it's a higher order connection, right? Like, do you love your wife? I like her a lot, right? <laughs> clearly, <laughs> it's clearly a different standard, right? Uh, yeah. So when Noah said, I love my job, my ears perked up. This kid has an emotional connection to his work. So immediately I followed up and said, tell me specifically what the Four Seasons is doing that you would say to me, you love your job. And again, without skipping a beat, Noah said, throughout the day, managers will walk past me and ask me how I'm doing, ask me if there's anything that I need to do my job better, not just my manager, any manager. And then he said, I also work at another hotel. And there the managers walk past us and catch us when we do something wrong. There the managers are always trying to drive performance and make sure we hit our numbers. He said, there I'd like to keep my head below the radar, get through the day and just collect my paycheck. Only at the Four Seasons do I feel I can be myself. Now, this is the exact same human being working at two different companies, and yet our experience of him will be profoundly different, not because of him, but because of the leadership environment in which he works. Our human advantage in a technology-driven world is our ability to have that 1% moment with people. And you can see just by asking somebody, it's the simplest question. Like, it's so simple, they probably didn't even think anything of it. Do you need anything to do your job better? How are you doing today? You can do hard things. And like I shared with you, in your listening sessions, the number one thing students ask for 
I want to be motivated when I go to school. I want people to motivate me. Like I see quotes on Instagram. I want people to motivate me. <laughs> that was a very common thing they shared. And so how do we define then this human advantage and break it down a little bit more? One of my favorite definitions of a visionary leader comes from David Nagras. It's a paper he wrote in 2014. He says there's four characteristics that make up a visionary leader. Number one, building trust. And trust is highlighted there, not by accident, but on purpose. Because if we don't feel safe, if I don't feel comfortable trying something new with you, I will never be able to do anything else, let alone achieve anything else. Number two, encourage creativity. Number three, recognize accomplishments. And number four, inspire a shared vision. So I want you to turn to the person next to you, maybe turn to the other side or behind, maybe choose somebody different. And I want you to share with them, what's the best job you ever had and why? All right, popular question. <laughs> I don't know if I can bring the group back from this one. <laughs> All right, you got your back to school icebreaker right here. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, this is the winner. I'm gonna start with this one next time. If I ever feel the energy in the room getting low, I'm all of a sudden gonna pull up this question. All right, so I, 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 you know, again, take it as your icebreaker. It's a good, quite a popular question. Seth Godin, in the book that I shared with you a little bit earlier, The Song of Significance, he asks, I think it was, I'm not gonna say the number, he asks, a lot of people this question and here are the four unanimous responses people shared to what made something the best job they ever had number one they surprised themselves with what they could accomplish number two they were able to work independently number three the team built something important number four people treated me with respect those are the four qualities that help people feel like they are currently in the best job ever. In 2017, I was recruited to go to Apple. And when you join Apple on the first day, they give you this beautiful card. And when you walk in, they tell you, this is where you're going to do the best work of your life. This is going to be the best job you ever had. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my god, I can't wait to see what I do here and what I do. And now when I look back, the best job I ever had was not at Apple. It was at the University of Southern California. I was recruited here when I was, current, when I was working as a high school history teacher, and we had started a one-to-one -one iPad program. And my sister, this is back in 2014, and my sister was a, she was an incoming graduate student at Keck in their physician assistant program. And it just so happened, their program asked them on the first day to bring iPads. Now remember, this is back in 2014, so this is about 10 years ago. At the high school I was at, we really, really struggled to get parents to understand why we were trying to implement iPads. What do you mean my kids are gonna use an iPad? I want them highlighting notes in the book. They're never gonna go to college if they're not highlighting notes on a piece of paper. We had a really hard time. So I told my sister, wow, I can't believe your program is so forward thinking. I want." I want to see everything you're doing. I want to see your syllabus. I want to see your notes. I want to see, I want to see everything you're doing because I want to go back and use it as an example and show parents, like, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And one day I kept asking her, asking her, asking her. One day she got so frustrated with me and she said, stop asking me. She's like, I don't understand what you want to see. We use it to download PowerPoints to Dropbox. She's, she's, like, she's like, what do you want? <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. That's so sad. Like, do you know you could do this and this and this and this and this? And she was like, no, I had no idea. But over the course of her three years there, we, we worked on a bunch of different projects together. And one of the projects caught the attention of her director. It was a community service-based project. But anyways, long story short, I got to then go into USD, become their director of innovative learning. And I got to completely change and transform a program to the point where after three years, they didn't even replace me they ended up hiring a position they had dreamed about for a really long time, which was um, a resident for street medicine. USC has a huge commitment to working with underserved communities in their area. And so one of the projects that we did here, one of my absolute favorite projects that we did was a professor, and he had a research paper he was really passionate about, because I told you, they're really passionate about getting their kids in underserved communities. 
It's like, oh my God, we do this paper. The kids, they each research a different air city in you know, Los Angeles. Gentrification is a really big theme over there. They go, they learn all these things and they're building empathy with these communities and they're gonna go out there and serve them. You know how the kids were doing those papers? <laughs> Google. <laughs> They weren't stepping foot into those communities because they had so many preconceived notions. So we said, okay, well, what if we change the question? Instead of saying go and research and learn, they had 40 different identifiers they wanted kids to pick up. Instead of going out there and doing that, why don't we have the kids, if, if this community had a message for healthcare providers, what would the message be? You can't Google that answer. It was a very small shift. We didn't need the whole system to change. We didn't need the whole higher education division to change. We didn't need to get rid of our, the standardized you know, board exams they have to take at the end. Everything's the same, but we just tweaked one tiny question. And so they had to go out there. And the number one realization they came out back with, we used to think these communities had so much crime and everybody would be miserable and sad, but we were shocked to see how much they support each other, how happy they are, all the things they're building, all the things they're doing, and they were able to identify these small gaps that allowed them to create these opportunities for things they could do in partnership to be better healthcare providers to these people. This is the best job I ever had for the reasons of all those four things. We built something so important here that when they had to make the transition, you can see here, like this doesn't look like your traditional higher ed classroom. The kids were interacting with iPads, they're taking notes in all these different ways, they're learning about themselves. I have never in my life heard a 27, 28 year old come to me and be like, oh yeah, I showed this project to my mom and she thought it was really cool. <laughs> At that age, that was the kind of impact we had and it was just absolutely beautiful. So the strategies I'm gonna share with you right now, when I look back and think about how did we get there and how are we able to do that in just three years, these are the top strategies we used that were completely different than most of the other change initiatives I had done before. Number one, we changed our fundamental belief as overwhelming as technology can seem. This core belief that guided our practice completely shifted the way we thought about our roles and the role of technology. This is Eric Brynjolfsson, he's the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab, has an amazing book called The Second Machine Age, is one of my personal favorite people. It says technology is not destiny, we shape our destiny. So then how do you begin to shape your destiny? Number one, by understanding how people feel. Google did a study a couple years ago called Project Oxygen, where they wanted to see, okay, what are the qualities of our top leaders so that we can, you know, help people build these characteristics? Easy, did the study, got their characteristics, it was done, done. Great, let's move on. Number two, how do you create good teams? And they got stuck. Because there wasn't one single qualifier, identifier that they could come up with that everybody had in common. Not GPA, not knowledge, not years of being, you know, working there. They just couldn't find a common identifiers. They spent two years, looked at 180 teams across 37,000 employees, and you know what the answer was? Feeling safe. The teams that were the most successful at Google were the teams that had the highest degree of psychological safety. So what does that mean? Amy Edmondson is probably most famous for this work. It's a belief that we will not be humiliated for speaking up with any ideas, concerns, or questions. So here's the perfect time to think about the difference between motion versus action. We all hear about the term psychological safety but how many of us have done a psychological safety survey with people at our site? It's seven questions, super easy. With ChatGPT, you don't have to worry about data analysis anymore. You just put the results in there and get the numbers. It's completely anonymous. But these seven questions give you an indicator to build on for how people are feeling. Because if people don't feel safe, then how are you gonna get them to share their ideas? Number two, how do we work better together. One of my favorite resources for this is Sparked. It's a completely free assessment. And what I love about this um, assessment is that it tells you what energizes you. And I have never taken an assessment where I feel, and I think majority of people who take this, I have maybe heard one person say it wasn't accurate, but majority of people who take this say, I feel so seen. Because it articulates a vision of you of how you feel in a way that you would never be able to do yourself. Robin is here in the room, and so is Sophia. 
we did this exercise, and this was a completely, this was, wasn't even a question, was to talk about each other, it was just take the spark type and share your results. But Robin, would you like to share what happened when you shared that your spark type was warrior? Yeah, it was probably one of the most beautiful experiences I've had. Yeah, that's, this is exactly what happened when she shared. She went around and she was like, I'm a warrior. It means I'm a champion. I'm an advocate. And every single person paused and had a story about she, how she had championed something that allowed the team to collectively move forward. It like wasn't even part of the exercise. But it's one of the most beautiful team bonding moments you can have where people not only get to learn what energizes them, but everybody else around you gets to hear the different things that energize people. So then what happens tomorrow? You get to build on that. The most important definition of collaboration is not us just getting together to move something forward. It's being able to come together to leverage our combined and collective strengths. If I'm really good at something and you're really good at something else and we can come together, you know what happens? We accelerate ideas much, much faster than if we're trying to do things alone. This idea oh. that... Hold on, I got to set this. So following that up, it's one thing to know what energizes you. Then what's next? And one of my favorite activities, and I don't know if any of you will remember this. I think, you know, I know a lot, a lot of you are new, but if you remember two years ago when we did the virtual session, at the end, I tried to facilitate an activity and the technology didn't work and didn't support us. But this is the activity that I wanted to share. And so I'm sharing it again, because when you follow it up with, so you've done the psychological safety survey, you understand what energizes everybody, and now you're coming together to talk about, let's just take the instance of your graduate profile and the start of the year. They have an incredible framework. In fact, their framework is so simple, you almost think it's too easy and it's not gonna work. But here's why they created the framework they did. This idea that we really just wanna listen to each other. And that, you know, and, and, it, and it's such a weird thing to have to make a case for. Like, so our new book, like, we actually realized we need to make a big case for this. You know, like, you need to listen to each other. Like, listen, like, just don't try to problem solve, don't try to, prove you're right. Don't try to make, you know, get, you know, move things forward in the right, in the way that you think is right, but really just listen to people and let the solution kind of emerge from that connection. And so it is, it's, it's so, it, he's right. It's so weird to say that you have to make a case for listening, but the framework that they have for being able to start projects. And in the beginning, that's, that's the beauty of frameworks. It's hard sometimes to have conversations that are not our norm, having conversations where we're nervous about what, what direction the conversation might go in. And that is the beauty of being able to rely on frameworks. Frameworks are structures. They allow you to keep control of an environment because there's time blocks, there are certain ways in which we're having a conversation. There's rules and those rules allow for progress and they prevent people from feeling stuck or getting overwhelmed by any type of potential situation. So the four areas they say you should talk about before beginning any projects. Let's say you're going back to your sites, right? Collectively as a group and you're talking about, when thinking about the graduate profile for this year, what are our intentions? What are our concerns? What are our boundaries? And what are our dreams? The number one thing I've learned from AI workshops is that we have forgotten how to dream. When I ask people what their dreams are, our aspirations are so low, and not because that's what you really want, but because that muscle of dreaming, of thinking and believing in bigger things has almost, like it's just not common practice. And so this is one of the reasons why I learned that cultures of innovation begin with a culture of empathy. And I'm gonna tell you the exact scenario that it happened in, because even though this scenario happened back in 2016, it's really no different than many of the conversations and challenges we're facing today. So while I was the director of innovative learning, the person who was the director of curriculum at the USC program was the complete opposite. Imagine like, 21st century meets like not even 20th century meets 18th century like it was awful it was painful and it was awful and one day during a faculty retreat and this was about 10 years ago so I was in my 30s so I wasn't that much older than many of the students who were in the program and so one day we're at a faculty retreat meeting and this lady is just hating and I mean hating on millennials and I don't think she realized, I mean, nobody else in the room was like in my age range, but I don't think she realized that I was in that category. And so while she's sitting here criticizing and bad-mouthing, it was really bad. 
I was just so angry. I was so, so, so angry. I didn't even know how to release my frustration other than call up my good friend, Beth Holland, and say, we need to write about this. Like, it is not okay for people in higher education at this age to be hating on millennials in this way. And one of the reasons a lot of this hatred had come up was students were complaining about two things. Number one, too much class time. They were in classes for eight hours a day, and they didn't understand why. They felt like some things could be done at home. And number two, this sounds so trivial, they wanted a discussion board. They wanted notes and assignments and things like that to be posted so that they could see them and if there were changes that those changes could be made but if you know anything about a higher ed system they set their syllabuses and dates and everything in advance they hand you a packet and they couldn't understand why anything needed to change along the way so it's just a lot of frustration overall and so I went back and I wrote this article like you know like when you label people and make these assumptions about them you have blocked the possibility of any type of solution building have you ever asked them why they feel the way they do instead of coming here and judging them because you're not even correct in many of your assumptions? But so often what I realize, this is one of my favorite quotes that I learned through this process. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they never have to worry about the answers. And this so often we feel like we're stuck in a system, right? Like Seth Godin says, like, you're not victims of this system. Like somebody created it, you can create something new. But so often we feel like we have no permission. And the reason is we often are asking the wrong question. The question is not why are millennials this way and how do we stop them from acting like this and how do we get them to be more like us? The question is why do they feel the way they do? Right? It was the reason you hosted the listening sessions here. Why? What's going on? Let's find out. Let's investigate. And so what happens? You ask different questions. And when you ask different questions, we win, not the system. And I'm going to give you a really good example of why I brought this up today. Because if you look online, kind of to the point that you brought up a little bit earlier, what is the number one assumption we're making about students in the age of chat GPT? What identity have we given them before we've even met them? That's how they're walking in to almost every single institution across the world, <laughs> right? Maybe a handful here and there that aren't, but the unanimous like, agreement is that students are going to cheat. We have labeled them with that identity before we've even met them. You will be shocked if on the first day you go to your students and you see, you ask any student who's walking anywhere, have you used this tool? Most of them will actually say no. Most of them don't realize though that ChatGPT is in their Snapchat, so maybe they have been using it in some other way, shape, or form. But most of them will say no, not yet. Remember, we asked them, didn't we, in a meeting last year? We thought all of them were gonna know about it. Maybe one raised their hand. But we've labeled them with that. It goes back to the atomic habits. Who do we want to be? But if we change the question, not from how do we prevent students cheating and how do we preserve our thing, because that question, the system wins. When we identify students and make the assumption that every single person who's walking in is a cheater, we're acting in a completely different way. Whereas if we begin asking, how do we use these technologies to help them build these skills for the world they're walking into? Now the system's got to come up with some better answers for you. And when we ask questions like this, we win. Because now every person's walking in and we're, we're, we're saying you are honest. You are ethical. You are creative. You have integrity. You have ideas. You are a human, <laughs> not a machine. And so that's kind of the importance of why we talk so much about identity. The next one, because when we think about being able to actually ask these different types of questions and do this more labor intensive work of changing things, what's the biggest barrier that most of us face? Time. I'm sure many of you have seen this chart that's circulating. It was a, it was a, from a research report that McKinsey did on how teachers are spending their time and the role AI could play. And for so long, we look at charts and we look at data like this, and we think, oh no, wow, that's awful, like social emotional learning, just a few hours, like we should really change that. But we don't often really have the tools or the time to do things about it. Well, now we do. So one of my favorite activities to encourage people to do that we do with people is something called audit your day. 
if you were to actually go through your day and just make a note, nothing fancy, grab a Google Sheet and put down, on this day I spent this much time doing emails, I spent this much time you know, visiting people, this much time in conflict resolution, all the different things you do, what does that come to? And then you also identify, was this energizing for me or draining? Because we talk so much about health and wellness, but most people don't realize that if you're spending the majority of your day on draining tasks, how are you gonna feel at the end? Not very good. You take this data, this Google Sheet, nothing fancy, and you upload it into Code Interpreter and ChatGPT, and you know what then begins to happen? It will start generating an, its insights. It will start telling you, okay, this is where you're spending your time. Here are some ideas and things that you could do to use your time in different ways. Here's how AI tools can help you, but you know what the most, like the best part of this exercise is? Instead of looking at McKinsey's chart, you've created your own chart. So imagine if every single person at your site came to a, the table in a meeting as you're talking about your intentions, your concerns, your boundaries and your dreams and your goals and the things you wanna do, and you were able to say, how are we spending our time? What could we get rid of? What can AI help us with? And what new opportunities do we have to do things that we've always just said we wish we could do this if we had more time? But even more powerful, imagine teaching students to do this. Teaching, treating their time the way we encourage people to treat their money, right? If you can't account for where your dollars are going, how are you ever gonna save or budget for anything that you need? And when you look over here, because direct instruction and lesson planning is what takes up the majority of a teacher's time, so you think about student outcomes, social emotional wellness, and some of the other priorities that your board had, and you begin thinking about, okay, how do we leverage some of this technology? And this is where it becomes so important to really think about the types of things we're asking, right? So if we're just asking for basic lesson plans, we're gonna get really basic answers, direct instruction, do a worksheet. But when we start going into more detail and saying, well, I'm a math teacher, this is the grade that I'm working with, this is how old my kids are, I really want them to be more confident in math and more engaged and more excited because they really don't enjoy it very much, we begin to get completely different responses. And when I look at this as a teacher, like I have such like flashbacks from like all the poster boards and all the work I used to have to do as I was creating these projects. The idea that I can see a lesson, right? Like this isn't even Google. Like on Google, you could see the lesson, but you still have to create everything yourself. The idea that someone's like, wow, you can do a scavenger hunt with fractions. I have no idea how to do that. Tell me more. <laughs> the fact that we can say, tell me more, create it for me, build it for me, opens and frees up so much of our time to finally be able to do the things we had always wished we could do. Which brings me to the next area that I wanna talk about and that how do we increase what's working? When we think, we oftentimes think of all the things we need to problem solve, all the things we need to fix, we don't often take enough time to think about what's working really well. So here's what I want you to do, again, with the same kind of group of people around you, maybe even get together in a group of four, expand your circle a little. I want you to think about, when thinking about your graduate profile, what are some of the things that are moving you forward? These are things that are going really, really, really well, that are helping move us in the direction we want to go. So go ahead. Take about a minute and just share. Some of the things that with your graduate profile are helping move us forward. These are things that are working well for us. All right, about 10 more seconds. I'm gonna ask some of you to share just really quickly some of the things that you think are moving you forward. All right, so anyone wanna share out with us just really quickly a word or two or something you shared with your groups? What is moving you forward? A bit of trust, absolutely. One more, one more thing that's moving you forward. Collaboration, there we go. And so, you know, you start to hear all these things that are working well. Then the next thing you wanna do is, okay, well, what are some of the things that are holding us back? What are the barriers, the roadblocks that we need to solve for? So go ahead and share that now with each other. Just one thing into your head. This is kind of holding us back. So this next one is a little different. This next one is a little different because where is with the what's moving us forward, you share those out loud. And this is usually something you do with post-its, with a group, more structured. When we talk about the things that are holding us back, 
This is why I say frameworks can really help because they help control the conversation. We don't talk out loud about the things that are holding us back. Instead, what we do is we take these red sticky dots and we go and we vote with our dots on the things we agree are holding us back. And instead of spending so much time dwelling on those things, as often happens if you open up the floor, we instead begin to ask, how might we? And we take that challenge that we agreed upon is holding us back, or the top two, three that you identified, and instead of focusing on the problem, we immediately go to the solution. How might we? What can we do to change that? So we turn that problem into something we might be able to solve for how? We have no idea. The number one area where most people get stuck in moving an idea forward is this stage. They can, they can create a vision. They can talk about what's working. They can talk about their problems. They can even come up with ideas, and then they get stuck. And that's where AI tools can be really, really, really helpful in being able to accelerate the process for you to be able to go out and create your impact. So here's what I want you to do. You each heard things that are moving you forward. I want you to go, I would do this with you if it was like, it was kind of hard to have you all get out of computer, but I want you to go home today and I want you to open up ChatGPT. How many of you have used it? Okay, so you've all got accounts. <laughs> you've all got accounts. I want you to go home and I want you to put in, hey, we were talking about the graduate profile today. We got a new school year starting. These are the things that are moving us forward. And these are the things that are holding us back. I want you to take this problem I've identified and I want you to create three different versions of a how might we. We call your ability to do this. AI can't know what your problem is, right? Like it needs a prompt. It, it needs some instructions, it needs some direction, it needs some guidance. It's not sitting here amongst us able to like, you know, gather insights from our conversation today. We call your ability to take those challenges, the things that are working, the things that aren't working, your ability to express your hopes and dreams, your human spark. It's the same human spark that I hope you're able to instill in each and every single person you work with and in each and every single young person who crosses your path. It's your ability to really be able to examine what kind of situation and context am I in? What are my problems? What are my dreams, my aspirations? If I could do this, then this is what my dream outcome would be. What specific results are you looking for? We wanna have 95% of people do X. Don't be vague, be specific. And the last one is my favorite. Once you've gathered those results, ask, what am I missing? Kismet, that last part of your human spark when you're working with AI is designed to mirror human connection, those serendipitous moments we have in conversation. I say something, you say something, and I'm like, oh wow, I never thought about it like that. Ask it, what am I missing? What else should I consider? In today's world, as we move forward, we have to be really mindful. What do we as humans do best? What do machines do best? And what does that partnership look like? That isn't just the responsibility of a teacher, it's the responsibility of each and every single human on this planet to help each other as we move forward because it's not going to be easy. And so I want everyone to remember that leaders are not defined by their titles. They're defined by their ideas and the impact you're able to have. When people ask me what's the power of AI, it's the biggest one I see, the ability to turn these ideas and our dreams into impact much, much faster than we've ever been able to do before. So I asked you at the start of today, if you heard an idea that resonated, you're curious about something, to craft your own, without the help of ChatGPT, to craft your own, how might we? So I have a Slido for you. And what I would like you to do is go to slido.com. I'm gonna make sure that it is up as it should be. Yep, it should be open. Go to slido.com and it should ask you for like a hashtag. It's gonna be SAUSD. And just put in your how might we question and let's take a look at what we've created. 
So you're just going to complete that sentence, how might we? And then I'm going to put them up on the screen in just a moment. It is completely anonymous. So just complete the sentence, how might we? Everyone have this slido.com and then SAUSD. These are absolutely incredible, and I will share them um, with Jerry, and then they can share them out with everyone. But, but the, these are your call to actions. This is the 1% step that you take. Just go home today and put it in ChatGPT. Hey, how can we do this? Get together with two more people. Ask them, hey, like, what did you think about this? How might we be able to do this? Start coming up with those ideas. 1%, just one small step. Each day is all you have to take to be able to make that impact. So I would love now if anybody has any questions, or I know it's 10 o'clock, but want to Yeah? Questions at all? We did leave a little bit of time for Q&A. There was, there was a lot to take in, a lot to process. And any questions? You good? You ready? All right, if you do have questions, I'll be around for a little while. But you have a beautiful list here of a bunch of different questions that are generating for all the different things that you're going to be able to do. If you do have any questions, like I said, I'll be around if you want to ask anything at all. But thank you so much. I have a, I have a question. So I have a question for Saba. So there are, you know, this is fairly new, even though it's been out for a year, maybe two years. Uh, but as it becomes more mainstream, and as I'm an adult in the p place of my career, the, the position in my life, the anxiety that I get with uh, having to even think about AI and its potential, what are some recommendations that you would give somebody like me who knows it's there, who knows the value and the importance of it, or is uncertain about the value and importance, but really, why should I make an intentional effort to learn more about it? Now, that's a, that's a really big question. I think what immediately comes to my mind, was it Lupe? Was that, that was your name, yeah? Maximizing potential. I think, you know, we live in one of the most expensive counties. I'm sure there's places that are more expensive, but we live in, we live in a really expensive place. And I think a lot of times when we talk about future skills and we talk about things we want to give our kids, we talk about skills, I think it's so important for us to ta start talking about like economic opportunity, money. How, how do you turn your passions, your interests, your strengths into being able to generate income? We talk about freedom. You know, I think a lot of our kids watch people, like, you know, have, create businesses and have access to all these other things. And the one thing that's really, really, really fascinating to me, I spend a lot of my time looking at people who carve out these paths because I'm always like, how can I get in that direction? How can I begin doing those things? It's like constantly a learning journey. But what I'm most fascinated by from so many of those individuals that have built these like incredible lives where they're doing just these really different things with mostly more freedom is they've all come from really, really, really challenging backgrounds. And I think so often we say the zip code theory, like, oh, like, let's blame the zip code you live in, or let's blame this and let's blame that. I just don't think that excuse exists anymore. Sure, it makes it harder. But today, the technology that we have access to just creates so much more opportunity. And if you have the ability to channel adversity into something positive, your ability to succeed, at least I believe, is double compared to somebody who's come from a more privileged background because you know what it means to struggle. You've watched other people struggle. Listening to Hector yesterday tell his story, like that resonates. Like when, when you grow up in those environments, that drives you on a different level. And so I would just say it's not even so much about learning the technology as much as it is being able to understand the person in front of you and what experience you're creating for them to help their future. I mean, ultimately, that's why we all do what we do, right? So I would say that's one. I would also say, you know, when I was at USC and I was a student again, here's the biggest thing I learned. I didn't need my teachers to know technology inside out. I needed my teachers to help me think through ideas, right? I always say, like, the podcast and the documentary were never assigned to me, but my most memorable teacher 
was somebody who just, like, I knew she cared. She was always asking me, what are you going to do with this? What, what do you want to do next? And somebody just asking that question, somebody helping you think through, why are you choosing this topic and not this topic? Here's a researcher or an author I think you should read about. Being able to just know that I had somebody who was there to help me was what I needed most to be able to advance my goal. I don't even think she knew I was working on a documentary. And she didn't really need to. Like, she was there to be my thought partner and my advisor. So I would just say, like, don't be intimidated by it. Don't feel like, I always say, my, my, young, my youngest sister is 30 years old. I will never be able to use technology the way my 30-year-old sister uses technology. I just won't. It's a losing battle. It's normal. Things are normal to her. I will never be able to use technology the way my four-year-old nephew is, uses things. It's a losing battle. But he doesn't need me to be an expert in technology. He needs me to be his moral support, to be, have his back, to have it be in his corner, to teach him things, to show him things, to expose him to things. We're not competing with people younger than us. We have to look at our strengths and how we leverage them together. The, the other c question that I get or comment that I get a lot is... Yeah. Yeah. It's the most important message you can probably take back to every single teacher is that you don't need to be an expert in this. You already are an expert in what you need to be. And you might have commented on this already, but I'm going to ask it in a different way. The, a lot of the feedback I get is, look, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm close to retirement. I know it's important. I know people are using it. Um, I don't want to hold them back. What, are some, what would be some advice that you would give to some educators that are in that mindset? Yeah, that's a really great one because I feel like, so my dad is 68 years old, okay? My dad is 68 years old, and two years ago, he bought a restaurant <laughs> and started up a completely new business against all of our advice. Like, like I said, we're four sisters, and we're like, Daddy, you know, why don't you just, like, retire? Maybe it's better for you to just go travel now, you know? Like, we can help you. Like, we can do all these things. But no, I'm going to buy this restaurant. Like, just came home one day. I bought a restaurant. <laughs> I came home one day, I bought a restaurant. And so one of the things that I'm so fascinated by is we have such a barrier in our minds when it comes to age, right? Oh, I'm going to be 50. I'm so old. I'm going to be 60. I'm so old. My dad is 68. He's 28 years older than me, and he just started a whole new phase of business. And so I always tell people, like, there is so much more to our lives than the job that you currently have or whatever it is you're currently doing. Our lives go together in so many phases. And I, I look at him now, and all I think about is health and fitness. All I think about is how do I be healthy enough now at this young age so that when I'm 68, I'm able to go and start something completely different. And so it may not be that you're using the technology maybe even to do and continue what you're currently doing, but do you know how many younger teachers are going to come into this profession and need your support and advice? And if you don't understand the dynamic or the context within which they're working, how would you be able to consult and support them? If you wanted to create a consulting career after you retire, where you nurture and help build this next generation, because we all know teacher professional credential programs aren't doing the work, right? Maybe some are, but most of them are not. So do you know how many people are going to need not your technological expertise, but your pedagogical expertise, your relationship building expertise? But if you don't understand the dynamic in which they're working, it's going to be hard then for you to kind of give that advice. So that's what I would say. We have a long way to go beyond what we usually think. <laughs>